All right. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Golden Dunkers Live. Today, I am joined with Gopher, former Gopher, former Gopher fan favorite, former Gopher great, um, current great guy, Jamal Abushamala. Jamal, how's it going? Kendall, great to see you, man. Thanks for having me on. No, awesome. Glad to have you on. You know, I just asked before if this is your first time being on. I know there's been some iterations of, you know, Golden Dunkers Live before we kind of revamped it. And you said no, which is, it just surprised me because you have been, you know, around the program so much. You've been so close to the program and, you know, you've done a lot with the Dunkers and with the Boosters and with the program as a whole. So, um, yeah, I'm glad to have you on just so go for fans and those that may not know and have been under a rock, you know, to kind of hear like what you have done with the Golden Dunkers in the past, you know, what's going on now with you in life as well as just your whole go for background. So. Um, before, you know, I get going with anything, one of the first questions I like to ask for those Gopher fans that don't know, everyone likes to hear that recruiting story, right? Everyone likes to hear how you even became a Gopher. Um, I know your story is unique, a lot like mine. So I think I think it'll be fun for Gopher fans to hear about it. But before we get into it, before we start talking Gophers, let's talk about how you even became a Gopher. Yeah, no, that's a it's a funny story because um you know, growing up here in Minnesota, I, I was a big Gopher fan. I wanted to come to Minnesota. You know, I grew up watching the Bobby Jacksons, the Quincy Lewis, that that whole that whole uh, you know decade there when they had some really good teams. Um, wasn't heavily recruited. Um, you know, in, in AAU, we uh, I had Cole Aldrich and then Blake Hoffarber was on our team as well. They were two years younger, but um, I just remember we were down. I think we were in Houston and. Uh, I saw Munson, Dan Munson, walk in the gym, and I was like, "Okay, this is my chance to impress the Gopher coach. Maybe get an opportunity to 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 get a scholarship." Uh, that didn't end up happening. Uh, we ended up um, my senior year. We had a really good year. We ended up winning state, and um, ended up getting a call from the coaches to uh, come in and meet with them. and And I thought that was an opportunity to uh, maybe get a scholarship. Um, at that point, I, that's where I was, my focus was, uh, but went in for the meeting, um, and, and it was really, it was, it was funny. It was unique. Um, and I'll tell kind of a quick story behind that. So we walk into the locker room <clears throat> and it was all the coaches and, um, coach Munson said, you know what? I haven't seen you play enough, but some of my coaches have, and I'm going to have each coach go around the horn and tell you what they think of you and whether they think you can play here at Minnesota. <clears throat> so um, coach Munson then passes it off to coach couch and coach couch was a, one of my favorite coaches there. He was great. He's like, you know what? I think offensively you're good enough, but I think there's some other areas you're going to really have to work at, but I think you can play here down the line. And coach Walker then goes and coach Walker said, yeah, I think you're same thing. You're a good offensive player. I think you're going to have some work to do on the defensive end. Um, and then he hands the mic over to, to <laughs> Coach Molinari. And if anyone knows Coach Mo, he tells it like it is, and he's a straight shooter, and he doesn't sugarcoat it. And Coach Mo said, let me do you a favor and save your family some money. <laughs> go somewhere else. Take a scholarship. Go play Division II basketball where you're going to get a free education, and don't waste your time coming here. You're not good enough. You're not strong enough. You're not fast enough. You can't shoot the ball good enough to play at this level, so don't come here. And uh, I was hurt. Like, when I heard that, I was, like, like devastated. Like, what is he tell? He's telling me this? Uh, and he was dead serious. So anyone knows <laughs> Coach Mo, like I said, he was dead serious. So I ended up um, – <laughs> I ended up leaving there that day, and they, they ended up offering me the opportunity to as a preferred walk-on, uh, which ultimately I ended up – uh, doing as, as you know, as you did as well. And, uh, I left there and I was so mad. I remember thinking about it and I'm like, man, why, how could he say that? But then at the same time, I was like, I'm going to go prove him wrong. And I, I really not, that wasn't the sole choice, but I was my whole time there. I was focused on proving coach Mo that I did deserve an opportunity to play at Minnesota. Um, and, uh, ended up deciding to walk on. So that's kind of how I got there. There's a lot more to that story. As you know, as a walk-on, you, you're kind of 
um, you know, you're paying for your meals. And I remember compliance was in there checking meals, making sure that, you know, I, I was, I was, you know, signing the book and making sure that I didn't get a, a free meal, a free meal on scholarship. So anyway, that was kind of the story long and short of it. Um, I talked to coach Mo actually, I think it was about a year ago and I, I reminded him of that. And it was so funny, Kendall. I was, I, I told him that and he said, yeah, yeah, I do remember that. And, and you know what you did, you proved me wrong. So, yeah. uh, so good for you. So anyway, that's kind of how I got there. Uh, funny story and coach Mo still one of my favorites. No, a hundred percent. I mean, I think I have met Coach Mo, and I haven't played for him. But you saying that that doesn't that doesn't surprise me that he yeah. does that. But that's uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's a certain chip on your shoulder you have. I think when you're a walk on that you you're, for sure that you have to wear it kind of silently in a way if it makes sense. You know what I mean? You kind of have to go out there and just feel like act like yeah, it's fine. You know, I'm just gonna go and hoop. But in the back of your mind, you're like no, I'm really trying to prove every single person in this gymnasium wrong. Yeah, they, no, they, that's a really good way of putting it. Like you have a chip on your shoulder, uh -huh. but you can't be, you can't be loud with it. You kind of have to just go in every day, do the little things, you know, like dive on the floor, get after guys, that, you know, some of the main players and it, but over time, you know, that's, it's a really good lesson. And, and I think you can attest to this. It really teaches you the kind of fundamentals of not only, basketball but life and and business and you just show up every day and do the right thing and and it, it'll take you somewhere no 100 percent. well that's an amazing really story there's been a i feel like it's funny i think the last golden dunkers live was i went up there as one of the best and i think that move might be like competition is now the best one eric curry came <laughs> eric curry came with you know the only reason him and his his mom came um, up to school there was because the Gophers were playing TCU in football and they're big TCU football fans. So he just wanted to get wow. a game out of a visit. And then he went there and he fell in love with the campus. And obviously Eric Curry's a, you know, a, a big guy for the program now. So for sure, just, uh, that's amazing. Yeah. Everyone has their story. It's true. You know, anyone you talk to, they have a story, which is really, uh, really fun. Good question. Yeah, for sure. So wanted to jump a little bit just into that time, man, into that playing time um, during your gopher, you know, heyday. So just some of those coaches during that time, you know, obviously we've gone through, we've gotten Tubby since then, we've gone through Patino since then, we're at Coach Ben Johnson now. So talk a little bit about the program, you know, kind of how it was during that time, kind of the transition, the changes you've seen that's happened now, you know, well, from the NIL side of things, which we'll probably get into later, but yeah. um, talk a little bit just kind of about the state of the program, you know, during that time and kind of the good and the bad that you've seen that's transpired since. Yeah. I, that, so when I came in, I came under, under Munson and I had two years under Munson. Well, really one and a half because Munson ended up getting fired about five games into my sophomore year. Um, and that's when Coach Molinari took over. So, but I kind of grouped that into one, that's one kind of uh, one coach. And then the, the next one, Tubby came my junior year, junior, senior year. Um, really the big difference. Um, I, I think the biggest difference was Munson ran his program uh, more as like a delegator um, where, you know, he, he kind of came up with the plan, but he had his offensive coach. He had his defensive coach. Um, he had coach Walker, his special teams coach. He kind of ran it like a football team. And he didn't talk a lot in practice. He kind of gave the time to each coach. Um, I mean, we had we had a lot of lot of talent. I mean, I think throughout my career we had some fantastic players. I don't know if we lived up to our potential, uh, but but we had some really good talented players. And I've talked to other guys from different schools, and they all said the same thing: like, man, how did you guys not win more with some of these guys? Um, Tubby was more of a Tubby was more of a dictator in practice, you know, yeah. as you can kind of recall. Nobody spoke with Tubby during practice. He kind of ran the practice, you know, drill by drill. And then assistant coaches would chime in. So it was ran really differently. Um, each coach had their different style. I think some players fit better under others, uh, under, you know, one coach versus, versus the other. But both, you know, I learned a lot from them. It was really a, um, it was an exciting time, I, I think, really when Tubby came in. Um, I mean, it was one of those where 
you remember when you heard Tubby Smith was coming to Minnesota to coach basketball, coach the, the Gopher basketball team. And, um, you know, it was a great experience. I mean, he, he brought a lot of um, unique a unique skill set as a coach, um, but we had some ups, we had some downs, and uh, but ultimately, I think it took the, the program to to a, a new heights from where it was. Yeah, for sure. I wanted you to talk a little bit about that Tubby time era. Like, how did that feel actually as like a player, like having that come? Because I mean, I know as a recruit, you know, and you first like hear or see Tubby Smith as like even somewhat interest, or even knows my name. You know, there's some sort of a oh, it's Tubby Smith. You know, so. Talk a little bit about that era, like, during that time, like, how that felt, because it was a <clears throat> transition and, you know, the marketing behind Tubby Time, like, water bottles, like, there was a lot that came with this. So, I mean, talk a little bit about, like, how that was, because for me, going into it, I'm like, wow, this is a this is a lot. Like, they love Tubby here, which he is a marketable guy. Yeah, no, you're spot on. It, it was It was huge. I mean... I remember the first meeting that he had with the team. I mean, they called us in and and Tubby came in, dressed all nice, had a had had his championship ring on. And and that that carried weight with us. I mean, when you see Tubby, I mean, he won a national championship at the biggest blue blood school there, you know, Kentucky, it doesn't get, you know, it's Kentucky, Kansas, Duke, North Carolina. Like, right. I don't it doesn't get any bigger than that. Um, so when he came in, I mean, we were all kind of starstruck. Like, this is our coach. This is crazy. Um, but it, it was, it was big, man. The branding, the marketing. I mean, it was, I remember the energy. You can still, I can think back and feel it of the hype around the program. I mean, we had more nationally televised games. I mean, it was a big deal to have Tubby here at Minnesota. Um, but it was, it was big. I mean, even around campus, I mean, the barnyard there was big. I mean, everyone was super excited. Um, I just think it ultimately, like we had some really good, I mean, in, in the Tubby era, we had some really good years, good teams. Um, but uh, it was great. I think it just took the program, like I said, to the next level of where it was. Yeah, no, for sure. Who was the, who else was on his staff during that time? Did he bring everybody, like Saul, Jers, who was, was it the original guys? Yeah, it was the original. Yeah, Jers, Saul. Um, Coach Taylor, and then uh, Coach E, Coach Esposito. So he kept that so, same staff. That's very interesting because, like, same guys. yeah, I think we, like, switched staff just in that second year when I had Coach Patino, and then, like, it kind of kept switching and changing on. So, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Coach. yeah. But, yeah, you're right. He did keep his staff, and he had Zoe, who was with him for a long time. Zoe good, Caitlin, you know. Caitlin and Emily were around for a long time as well, too. Caitlin and Emily were kind of the, yeah, they kind of held the program together. Um, so, yeah, it, it was unique that he kind of kept everyone there for kind of most of his tenure, or if not all of it. Yeah, for sure. So I want to talk a little bit just now about the Gopher program during that time. But during that time, I mean, I think every time their Big Ten basketball is tough. But talk a little bit about 2000s Big Ten basketball a little bit. Talk a little bit about just really one I want to hear first question in this series of questions the toughest matchup you remember, you know, team wise, and then toughest matchup you remember during that time, um, individual wise. Yeah. So the toughest team, um, and this probably would kind of roll into individual too, was the Ohio State team from 2006. That was like Greg Oden, Conley, David Lighty, um, Daquan Cook. I mean, they had, <laughs> they were, they had a squad. Unbelievable. I mean, they had, they had like, I just remember, like, with Greg Oden, there was a lot of hype around him. Um, but the guy, like, he had a broken – his his shooting hand or wrist was broken for that whole season. And I remember he shot left-handed. He shot free throws. I think it was left-handed. And he put up, like, really good free throw numbers. And then across the board, his numbers were unreal. So if that guy could have stayed healthy, he'd be – he would have been unbelievable. I mean, there was a play – that sticks out to me where we were at the barn. And if, if you remember Bryce Webster, Bryce was a big guy. He was like six, nine, uh, big guy, um, really athletic. And Bryce was guarding Odin and Odin caught the ball in the post and took back them down two dribbles, two or three dribbles, and then jumped over Bryce with his left hand and dunked on top of him. Just like, <laughs> 
That's it's it. just like a post up, back up, like dunk yeah. on him. And I remember thinking in the game, I was like, oh my God, like hey, you don't see that. In very often. So I think that team was stacked. I mean, they had, I think even Evan Turner was on the bench. I mean, they were unbelievable. Um, one of the toughest matchups was um, D Brown. I remember I had to guard D Brown and he was, um, he was a part of that Illinois team. I think a couple of years before he may have been on the team, but that's when they had like, um, you know, they won the national championship or they were, no, I think they were runner up or, or final four. Uh, but D Brown, they ran the offense. Bruce Weber's offense was literally D Brown would run in circ- like a figure eight. Yeah. And they would screen and they would have big guys just screening him the whole game. And I remember a couple plays I had to guard him. And uh, I just remember thinking like I, that, like you have to be in unbelievable shape to, to keep up with him. But he would come off those those screens and just catch and fire and was lights out. So one of the toughest kind of individual matchups that I remember. They were so good. I mean, I'm coming from St. Louis, so big Mizzou guy. So Mizzou, Illinois is a big matchup. No, other than that, yeah. big, 10, big 10, like I see it, but I'm more of a big 12 guy growing up. But Illinois was huge. And so D Brown and Luther Head and Darren Williams were like a special time growing there you up. Go. For me to even yep. like them, I, I was supposed to hate Illinois shows how good they really were. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, they had a, t- they had a really good team. Yeah, for sure. What um? So last one on that one is venue, toughest places to play, or I guess place to play, because like I have a tie. Yeah, with I know which two of mine. But what what would you say, Matt? I get this question a lot. Yeah, that's a good question. And I I don't. I mean, there are, every venue is so unique. I think the most like I'll, I'll start at the back end. Like the boring venues are like Penn State because like it's a beautiful arena, but no one's there, and then. You have like Northwestern, which is like a high school gym, which was like a shooter's gym, which I liked. Um, but I think the hardest, I, I remember Michigan State. I just, I remember it was probably, that was like one of the toughest places to play. I mean, they get rocking. They have the student sections, like the first 10 rows around the court, which I think is, a, I mean, they're right there. Um, and then Indiana is is tough too. And that's a really it's a fun place to play uh, just because of the history and whatnot. I know I'm kind of rattling off a few, but like, but I, I don't know if it's the referees or what, but like Wisconsin is like so hard to win there too. Um, it wasn't necessarily like a fun place to play. I wouldn't say it was yeah. just a hard place to win at, but I, I would say the best atmosphere was probably Michigan state. For sure. I, I agree. What, what are yours? I would say Michigan State and Indiana were kind of the two. I think Michigan State having all the the fans right around and them being there, like I think dang near they were there before we got there for shoot around, like the yeah. first official one, like the hour and a half before, like full though, like completely full student section. Izzo, I think they called them, right? The Izzo, yeah, yeah. You know what they did, Kendall? They used to have, and I don't know if they still do this, but they'd have like a little newspaper article. Mm-hmm that like had all of the details of like the, the opposing players. And I, I just remember Facebook was new when we first, when I was in college. So it was like 2005, 2006. And I remember, I think it was probably my sophomore year when they kind of opened it up to all the different schools. So you didn't have to have just a college email address, but right before we played Michigan state, we would always, all the guys on the team would get like a hundred friend requests from Michigan state fans. Yeah. And everyone would decline it because you didn't want them to have your whole profile information. But I remember Rico Tucker, one of my teammates, Rico would accept everything because he just I, I mean, he just wanted wanted to have more friends. Yeah. But they knew they knew everything about Rico. They knew his girlfriend's phone number. They knew all of his everything about his interests. And they used to just get on him. So uh, I thought that was kind of funny how they used to dig for details before we came yeah they were i think i remember that a few times <laughs> they were on it they were that's dedication though that's real dedication. yeah like, yeah real sure. stuff. and then indiana would be the other one for me too i think it's just so like steep it goes so high up and it's so yeah. loud like, a funny story from that one with like tubby i remember like we were preparing for how loud it was because it was supposed to be such a big game and he knew it was hard to hear 
So like iPads just came out. So we tried to like run our plays on iPads like during that game and like they would hold it up on the sideline and show what the play was. And then like Dre or Matt or whoever was that point guard would like try to look at it and call the play. And it lasted like it lasts like 12 minutes of the game. <laughs> right. Get that out of here. Like the guys <laughs> could barely see it over there. Like it was, it just didn't even work. But you literally it was that loud. You just couldn't hear. And that's that was our that's what we went with, and it it didn't happen. The iPad solution was a one and done thing for us. <laughs> he had to get like the you know like in football on the sidelines. Yeah, they have like those big signs and colors and all that. Yeah, yeah, and was, that's what that's what you got to do when you go to Indiana. Yeah, exactly. It was like the first generation iPad too, probably. So it was like you could barely see anything from that. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's funny. Yeah, Indiana. Indiana was definitely a tough one, and then a sleeper. I would say, I don't know if it was the rest too or just the environment, but Purdue was a tough one. Oh, like, Purdue. Yeah. I'm in there. I don't God, know. You're right. That Purdue, like, I don't think I ever, that was, I think, the one oh. school I don't think I ever won at. Yeah, we never won. Never, it. Yeah. You're <laughs> yeah. right. It's like, it is crazy. It's like a bowl and it's so mm-hmm. loud. And those fans, the whole game are, are going crazy. And, and they just have like a different edge there when they're playing at home. Right. As well. Uh-huh. But you're right. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. It's a sleeper for sure. It's a sleeper. I don't think we ever won there. So yeah. Yeah. What man. was the what was the easiest place or what was like the oh we got this type of venue for you? I would say Penn State for sure. Like mm-hmm. we should go ahead and get that one done. Um I don't know if there's a I say Penn State. I, I don't want to say Michigan, but in a weird way, I feel like we performed well at Michigan. Yeah. For some reason, yeah. like they were yeah. in the squad, but it was nothing intimidating about going there to play. For sure, versus the other school. I think it was like a. I think it was like a sleepy crowd. I yeah. think that's why. Like it's quiet. Like they didn't have the energy as a lot of other venues. But you're right. They don't. There is. Yeah. yeah. There, yeah that might be it. There isn't that much energy. There's. Yeah. I mean, they go on their runs and it's loud, but. Like the student section is not memorable there. I don't know if it's the place right. or what, but yeah, that's that's one that's not quite there for us. Yeah, there was uh, when we played there one year. I think it was so. Their students are right behind our bench. Mm-hmm. You remember that? And like yeah. literally, like two feet behind us. And uh, I think it was my junior year. Um, Spencer taught. So we had the water jug on top. Like you know, they'd stack the cups on top with like water in them and this i don't think they had like a lid on it at this point but one of the students behind the bench poured vodka into one of the waters and i think they handed it to spencer and spencer like spit it out and was like oh my god there's vodka like someone poured <laughs> vodka in there uh we'll have to, you'll have to ask spencer if you ever have him on but i remember i i'm pretty sure that happened uh and spencer threw a fit about it but uh I would. And I think that after that, they started bringing the lids and like started putting lids on top of the the water. That makes sense. Yeah, we have to ask him about that one. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's definitely one he remembers. Then he, well, Spence for sure will remember. Yeah, yeah, man. Well, here let's let's fast forward now to the to the current to the Gophers of the current. Let's talk a little bit, man, just about state of the current program. I know second year of the Ben Johnson era. So one of our all fellow alums. Um, just talk a little bit, man, about the thoughts of the program, you know, kind of, you know, what you've seen so far, where you see is going in the future here. Yeah. That, so I think Ben is the real deal. I think he's going to get the program where it needs to be. Um, you know, surprisingly, I've had a couple people say like, hey, well, how long does Ben have uh, before, you know, obviously this team this year is struggling and, you know, they've had a lot of injuries and they're they're young and they're they're just figuring it out as they go. Um, but I've had people ask that. And I, I think, I mean, year one was like a Ben had nobody, like it was like a clean house and he had to go and find pieces to, to kind of just have a team. Um, I mean, he didn't even have a year to really recruit. So year one, I, as PJ Fleck would say, was really year zero for Ben. Yeah. And then I think, I think like this year you're seeing some really good promising young players that I think will turn into some stars. Um, and this is really his first kind of team, like his first guys, his first round of guys. Um, I know we have some exciting recruits coming in next year, but um, 
the guys play hard. They seem to really enjoy playing for, for coach Johnson. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful. And I think he's going to get the, the team turned around. It might not be next year, but I think the year after that is where we really start to see things ramp up. And um, hopefully at that point, the, the program starts to roll. Yeah, no, for sure. I completely agree. It's I feel like it can get, one, I think a lot of go for Minnesota fans just are kind of impatient. So I think that's kind yeah. of why we know that, that that was asked. But sometimes you can get lost that it's only year two or, like you said, year one, if it's year two mm-hmm. or last year. Um, because he was an assistant maybe for so long. He was kind of right. on the program. And, you know, that's just kind of kind of confusing people, right? Where mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, he's been around. But, yeah, it's, it's still super early. And I completely agree. I feel like he's the real deal. Um, you know, I've spoken with Eric Curry, um, EJ Stevens, right? So two guys who played with him, played for mm-hmm. him. You know, luckily I played under him when he was an assistant coach as well, too. And I completely agree with you. And it's, I think it's also an extension of what they both said. He's the real deal. Um, he's the he's the right type of coach, I think, for the program and, like, you know, for what's needed. But during this time, it's definitely a, a culture of kind of impatience. So yeah, you have to remind yeah. Most to, to be patient with it. But like you said, I think we have some young future Big Ten stars on this roster. Yeah. And uh, Agree. a heck of a recruiting class coming in as well. Yeah. And I think this year for the, the young guys, the, the freshmen that probably wouldn't play a, a whole lot if they came into a an established program, this time that they're getting right now where they're getting, you know, beat by 35 points on the road and they're just – this is good for them because you really have to learn how to win on the road in the Big Ten and, um, and, and getting kind of a wake-up call that this is a legit – like this league, there are no gimmies at any point along the way. So, uh, so it's good for them, and they're getting some good experience against some good, strong, bigger, stronger, more experienced players, um, and that will only help them two, three years down the line. Yeah, 100%. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited for what's going on. And I'm excited for what's going to happen. You know, one yeah. thing I wanted to I wanted to touch on, man, is just like this whole new era that with basketball kind of I'd say social media is a good way mm-hmm. to describe it and just, you know, a lot of pressures. I just want to hear from you, man. Just talk a little bit about, you know, your thoughts on, you know, the difference between you were playing and kind of the pressures you see, you know, and can imagine that guy's face, you know, in this day. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I, I mean, I was just on the cusp of when social media became a thing. Like, I don't even think Instagram was out back when I was, you know, before I graduated. Yeah. Um, You're more. I of think a space guy. I was. I was a MySpace. Yeah, we all. Yeah, Facebook was kind of the thing. Yeah. Uh, we had. I mean, what we had Twitter. Uh, Twitter was out there, but. But it was like just kind of getting ramped up. Um, but you're right, like the pressures, I mean, everything, and this is so cliche because everyone talks and says it, but everything is under a microscope for these guys um, and girls. Like if you're an athlete uh, and you're out and about, people are, are watching you and they have cam- everyone has a camera. Um, so you really have to be mindful of your how you're perceived when you're out and about, which I think is a big deal. Um, and, and as a coach, I can't imagine trying to manage that, you know, when you have some young 18 to 22 year olds that are out and about trying to figure out their, their path and their journey. Um, you know, you do some dumb things and, you know, if it's caught on camera, it can be detrimental to your career and your reputation. So I think that's, that's number one this era of like NIL, like I I think five years from now, we look back at what college basketball is and we're like, man, remember what it was like five years ago when guys, when guys and girls were playing and, you know, for really just scholarship or if not on scholarship, like (laughs) for the love of the game. Um, Because some of these, the creativity, I don't think we've seen that quite yet um, kind of blossom into what it's going to be for, players making money and branding and, and whatnot. So, um, so it's, ex- it's exciting for the players, but I think it's also confusing and, um, and going to be tough to navigate. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's definitely a slippery slope. I think there's a lot of good comes from it. I think 
the idea of likeness and name, image, and likeness is important, you know, and it was something that needed to be done, but now there's going to be a lot of solutions that need to be found that I don't think anyone has the answers to quite yet. Right, for sure. Yeah, and I think, yeah. I think the University of Minnesota is probably going to be, if everyone else is jumping in, they're going to be at the back of the line waiting to see what happens. Like, I don't think they're going to be um, kind of leading the way in this whole new era. So it might take some time for them to figure it out and how to, you know, I know they have like the dinky town athletes or whatever the, the fund is that they're doing to, you know, for NIL purposes, but it might take a little time, but hopefully, you know, we have Minnesota and the twin cities has a lot to give and, um, you know, if Ben Johnson does a good job of turning the program around, I think there's some some really good potential to get people involved in that. Completely agree. Completely agree. Well, we're wrapping. We're coming up here on this half hour mark, so I want to you know wrap things up just for you to update everybody on you know how things are going, what's going on with you. Uh, I know you're around the Twin Cities. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot, a lot to offer yeah. right now. So I mean, talk a little bit about what you're doing, what's going on, and update the fans. Yeah, sounds good. So I'm I'm living, uh, yeah, like like you said, in Minnesota, uh, kind of West Metro. I'm, I'm over in Plymouth. Um, I work at UBS, so my you know for a career I went into wealth management. So I'm on a big team uh, of of wealth managers, and and we really just work with clients. Um, business owners is kind of a, our, a focus of ours, and we work with them on you know planning, estate planning, tax planning, retirement planning, all the above. So. Um, we have a big team, like I said, uh, it's really exciting. We have great people. Um, it's been a lot of fun for me to kind of work my way into that. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and from a personal side, you know, I got a one year old, uh, a little over one, she's about 15 month old daughter, um, and, uh, married, like I said, living in Plymouth. So life is good. It's, it's been great. Uh, it's been fun to stay involved with the program and kind of watch from the outside, but, um, no, it's been a good, it's been a good journey post basketball. Awesome. Yeah. And you talk a little bit about, you know, working with the program. I know you were really close to the Golden Dunkers and helping a lot. Talk a little bit just about that time and kind of, you know, what you were doing with the Dunkers, uh, you know, over the past few years. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was on the board for a little while of Golden Dunkers and it's a, it's a great group of people, um, you know, great organization, great mission of kind of just being a support system to the program. Um, and, you know, the, the members that are a part of that are very passionate about go for basketball and um, really are selfless in what they do to help the program. So it's been a great organization, I think, for the for the program. I'm sure Coach Johnson would it would uh, attest to that as well. Um, but I think, you know, in years past, they've, they've purchased, you know, uh, suits for the guys just to kind of help teach kind of that life mission. And uh, so anyway, doing a lot of things, not just on the basketball court, but just kind of broadly for the program. Um, but uh, yeah, it's great. And I think the, the program needs more of that, more support uh, and more people that want to get involved to, to see them have success. And I think success breeds success. So I think, you know, once you kind of get the ball rolling, I think people will be, uh, you know, knocking on the door, trying to get involved and, and try to be a part of it. Yeah, a hundred percent. I agree. I think there's a certain type of fandom in Minnesota. You know, I'm not from there. You being from there, but coming from there, it's just you feel it. Success or not, at the beginning of every season, there's this pride about it. Whether it's the Gophers, whether it's the Twins, whether it's the Vikings, and that's the unique part about being a Gopher. I think in the Minnesota Gopher program is it is intertwined with all these professional teams in the city of Minneapolis. So you know that fandom does really hit it, hit it high. So. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. I love what the Dunkers are doing. Yeah, absolutely. No, they're doing great work. So uh, hopefully more people get involved and, and see the program kind of continue yeah. to grow. For sure. No, I think I think that and I think as us as alumni, I think we need to keep coming together too and, you know, figure out more ways to connect uh, and get together as well and, you know, feed off of what the Dunkers are doing and learn from them too as well and just not just – you know, utilize their events and what they do, but come together ourselves too and come up with some yeah. more stuff to do the program. I would agree. And you know what? I'll say this because I'm passionate about this side of it where, um, you know, when you're an athlete, you're kind of, you know, you're, you have your head down, you're working on your, your training. 
uh, year round school. You're, you're trying to do, you know, have a job to make a little bit of money. Um, and then once you're done and you graduate, some guys go overseas, some guys play professional, some guys try to figure out what's next, but it's a really, and I've talked to so many different athletes, not just basketball. It's not just here at Minnesota, but just in general, it is a, it is a tough, really tough transition. You basically have to rebrand yourself. Um, and Kendall, you and I have talked about it in the past. It's, it's one of those things where I think if as an alum of the program, you're right, we do need to kind of be there and help these young guys figure out what's next. And if it's not while they're there, I think that's part of it, like educating them on like what, you know, the platform that you're on and how to use that in the best manner. But then what's next? Like, what do you want to do? Uh, because basketball does not go forever. <laughs> I mean, I'm 35 years old. I'm still playing a little bit, but I'm like at the tail end of it. I mean, my body's starting to feel it. So when that time comes, uh, whether you're overseas playing professionally or, you know, you're 22 and you're trying to figure out what path to take, I think we all have to be there and kind of create a net to kind of have guys come to you and say, what do you do? tell me about your path, your journey. Cause I think that's where it really resonates and it helps. It helped me. I talked to a lot of former players and, and they were very helpful. Some even golden dunkers, some of the, um, some of the people there were really helpful to me um, to just kind of talk about their story and, and what's next and how to figure that out. Cause it's hard for anybody, but when you're, when you're so focused on basketball and school um, it kind of sneaks up on you. Yeah, it, no, it, it really does. And even when you're, you know, when you try to do other things, it's tough sometimes. You probably experienced it and during my time, you know, it was tough. Like, you know, during the time when I wasn't playing as much, great. Let me focus on school and try to graduate early and start masters and do all this stuff. But even when you do that, there's conflict of practice and mm -hmm. scheduling and all this, you know. So it's also not easy for guys. Like they kind of have to go outside of the box to make sure they're kind of better in themselves in other areas outside of basketball. So, for sure. You really need guys like us, people that have been there to kind of show them what that blueprint looks like to even do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so hopefully as an alum, like as an alumni group, we can stay together and, you know, kind of help help kind of support Ben from behind with current former players uh, to kind of get them to figure out that next step. For sure. One hundred percent. Well, Jamal, it was great. Um, it was great chatting today. I think this is going to be one of maybe a couple episodes we probably need to jump on and talk about some updates and end off just on what we were talking about, the alumni things and some plans that we can maybe do with the Dunkers and other community things around here and, and talk through that. But, uh, man, thank, thank you for your time today. Thanks for your stories. I think it was a great little prelude to today's game so everybody can kind of check it out. I think we just tipped off, but – I appreciate your time today and I'm sure all the dunkers appreciate your time and, you know, now being, you know, on the board and helping with the dunkers, there's nothing but positive things said about you all the time from the dunkers. So I think that's awesome. A lot of positive things, a lot of positive light to their, to their program. And I think it's just important for us as alumni to keep kind of bridging that gap to the dunkers because they are such an important program and it's tough when you can only, you know, go to that dunkers dinner after practice when you're tired and, you're not thinking through a lot of things, you know, like it's hard when it comes to that. So it's good to just kind of keep bridging the gap between those dunkers and the alumni, current, former, whatever it may be. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. So thanks for having me on, Kendall. This was great. Good conversation. Yeah, I appreciate it, Jamal. Golden Dunkers, Golden Gophers, everyone in Gopher Nation, we appreciate your time today. For Jamal Bushmala and Kendall Shell, we'll see you next time.